Small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. It's a new kind of school. Together we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. Small Business School is made possible by support from IBM. We're not just for big business anymore. At our website, built just for you, discover how technology can move your business forward. When it's your business, everything matters. IBM. And by Southwestern, providing learning solutions in business and economics. Southwestern is part of the Thompson Corporation. And the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. We're where you live your life, we're where you run your business. Hi, and welcome to Small Business School. Grab a pencil. You'll want to take notes if you're interested in growing a business or even starting one. I'm Hattie Bryant. From Madison, Wisconsin, a place with plenty of cyclists on the roads, comes this program about growing a business that had become stale. Research shows the business owners learn best from other business owners, and some call this peer-to-peer -peer learning. For this reason, we bring you our master class each week. When I studied music in college, I had teachers, but was also privileged to attend master classes, which were always taught by a working musician. Here, you'll learn from a hard-working and successful business owner. This is not about theory. It's about an up-close and personal look at what works. Step into our master class with Chris and Sarah Fortune. What a perfect day. What a beautiful place. Cyclists from all over the world come to Wisconsin to experience hundreds of miles of paved roads, not only in the city, but in the country too, free from traffic. Farmers needed smooth roads to keep their milk from turning to butter. Now we're gonna take your new receiver, get it out, slide it into the receiver. If you have a bike, you have to have a rack. Graber Products make some of the world's best racks right here in Madison, Wisconsin. Set it up on the rack all the way to the back, like so. Set it in the cradles. All right. Slide it forward so you've got this supporting your seat tube and this supporting the top tube. Take the strap across the top. This is a very easy little notch. It's like a hook and eye system, sort of. Yep. Very nice, very simple. Now you've got support across the top so the bike doesn't bounce. You also have support across the bottom so it doesn't sway so bad. There, Consumers want product that's user friendly and so do our dealers. And so we're driving to supply, supply product that are very user, user friendly out there. You know, the bicycle industry is a booming industry. Uh, and people, it's a great family sport. It's a low cost recreation. Uh, people can take their bikes on vacation and, and go out and ride as a family. And, and they love to do that. Mm -hmm. And we want to provide them the transportation to get them where they want to go safely and securely. You know, we, whenever we develop product, there are, there are three musts in development of a product. The, and it's very simple and very basic. The racks must stay on the car, the bikes must stay on the rack, and we don't want to scratch or mar the car. And it's very important to get the people there safely and securely. Yeah, our warranty rate is less than one quarter of a percent, mm -hmm. and it's critical that uh, we, we supply them product that gets them where they want to go. Sarah and Chris Fortune bought the company in 1989 when it had 24 employees and 3.3 million in sales. Today, they employ 60 people and have tripled the sales. I always knew that he'd work, put himself through school, put himself through college. He worked when we were engaged. He worked nights, student taught, and you know, then got his studying done. He was just the kind of guy that always worked, so I never, I don't really think I've ever had any real doubts in where he wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Every job he took on, he succeeded. When we looked at businesses to buy, we had a scope of what we wanted and what we didn't want. And I really felt that uh, 
I was driven to develop a product or get into a situation where we had an opportunity to develop a brand. I didn't want to get into the retail environment and I didn't want to uh, stay in distribution because I didn't feel that uh, with distribution you had your control of your own destiny. I think there's tremendous value in developing a, a brand and when we looked at Graber as a company, we felt they had a great reputation in, in the marketplace. We went out and we visited stores and did some market research talking to the dealers out there to get a feel for what was going on. And the, the market was expanding. They, they, they uh, had some tremendous opportunity out there if they just focused on the resources that they have and they didn't do that. The two gentlemen, one was 68 and the other one was 75 and they wanted to, to move on with their life. They were trying to maximize the, their balance sheet and their profit, profitability at the risk of the future of the business. There's three types of people and three types of companies out there. There's companies that wonder what's happening, companies that watch what's happening, and, and people that make things happen. And they were wondering and watching what was going on out there. They had a good nucleus of people here when we, when we bought the business. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a good reputation in the marketplace as being honest and honorable people. Mm -hmm. And so that was an important thing to us. Mm -hmm. You know, part of our business plan states that we want to be honest and do the right thing in the way we approach our business and our customers. And they had that going for them. They had, uh, so you didn't have to undo. We, correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the image of Graber in the marketplace was more of a nuts and bolt manufacturer and things from a development and design standpoint had, had leapfrogged where they were at. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have your customers, or not your customers, but whenever you have your competition obsolete your own product, you're in a, you're in a big danger zone and that's what they had happened to them. Did you start with a bank loan? Yes. Okay. And is, was it from one bank, Venture Capital? It was from, mean, from one bank. And it's Associated Bank. And uh, it's, they're great people. And, you know, business uh, is very cyclical. And you, it isn't always uh, growth and prosperity. You have some rough times along the way. And it's very important to find somebody that's willing to work through the good and the bad times with you. And we found somebody. What are your top business issues? Innovation. Product development, go beyond what is some, don't copy somebody else. Get beyond that so that we can really be recognized out in the market. So now, Bob, explain to me what this is. Everyone at Graber talks about innovation. Chris's dad invented a product Graber is selling worldwide. Now, you'll open that lid like this, and you have your helmet. Yes. You place in there, your fanny pack, like so, and you'll lock it. So how did you think of this? Well, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal about the cyclists starting to commute and they, when they get to their destination, they have no place to store their personal belongings as far as uh, that's concerned and they, they're concerned about the bike. Just watch the bike and your personal you know. What's it like to have your dad around the business? It's, it's just great to have him around. You know, he's dedicated and committed to getting it done and it's just a pleasure to have him around. It's my, he, my dad's my best friend and it's, uh, it couldn't be any better than that. You couldn't ask too much from that, could you? This is Brian Butch, and Brian's been with us 17 years. He's an extremely talented tool maker. Are you like all that. constantly innovating? Uh, yeah, we're, we're constantly innovating. I mean, yeah, we to. Chris and Sarah took advantage of the University of Wisconsin Stout's Manufacturing Technology Transfer Program to help improve efficiency. And one of the elements that uh, we, they focused in on was cellular manufacturing. And with cellular manufacturing, quick change tooling was a very important aspect. Well, we look at a part, each time you touch a part, it costs us about five cents. So what Brian did in the tooling that he developed was that when the, the press came down and hit the part, instead of hitting it twice, he developed the tool where it only hit it once. So they were taking a raw tube, you can see it's not formed or punched in any shape or manner. It takes it from the round tube, uh, forms this U-shape into it, fit into the receiver of the hitch. So basically, I just bent that down in there. Then you go into the next stage, flip the tube sideways, and it's going to punch them holes. And you, you built the and tool that that's right. right, we built the tool in there. Punch these holes in here. What cellular manufacturing has done for us is several things. One is it's uh, improved the quality of the parts because you have a, a much smaller production run. It's um, reduced our work and process inventory, and it's improved our efficiency by almost 25%. How is that different from an assembly line? 
Well, it's, it's very similar to a, to an assembly line. I don't know that it is any different from an assembly okay. line. But what the, some assembly lines do is they are feeding parts to an assembly line that are processed in an in a operation outside the assembly line. Okay. Within the cellular manufacturing, everything is processed. You're uh, doing it all right here. Right here. We approach business a little differently. We try and limit our number of uh, vendors out there. We have one major tubing vendor in which we form a, tr a true partnership with them. Mm -hmm. And we're so, not going back and forth and saying, hey, we need a cheaper price here, or we need this or that. We sit down and develop a strategy with them, and we're, we're honorable in the commitments we make to them. Mm -hmm. So rather than having three or four suppliers on that one product who are always competing and never knowing if they're going to get the business or not, you selected one and said, we're, we're committed. We're committed. And they're, they're sharing technology with us, too. We send engineers down there and to work with them to try and uh, get a better, better understanding on how we can do our, our business better or perform uh, manufacturing at a higher level. We've really adopted a win-win philosophy here. And in my younger years as a manager, I, always was, I, I wasn't always that way. I, you know, you go out and win at all costs, and it, you, you didn't gain long term on that. You made some mistakes along the way. Oh, in your old age of 44, <laughs> you've mellowed out. <laughs> well, I, you know, I ran a, I ran a branch. I was a branch manager at 30 years old, running a, a three or four million dollar company, and mm -hmm. you know, you, you develop a win at all cost attitude, and you know, that's a very short term um, approach to life and business. Mm -hmm. And over time, you really. Uh, the way you approach it. And, uh, so, I, I have a great mentor, uh, my wife's father, uh, Phil Hendrickson, has done just, it's great to have somebody like that guide you and influence your life and uh, give you um, certain uh, goals and, and values to run a business. Was he a small business owner? He was a business owner and a manager of a business. He took a business from 500000 to $150 million. Watched him do that, and when we bought the business eight years ago, uh, he's on our board, and he's really he's one of he's the person I go to for for advice. He's a my mentor, and so it's great to have somebody like that. And he really took on that approach. Not only he he approaches life that way. It's win win. And so, how did you develop your board? Well, it, it was um, people that we knew. It was. Um, our bankers on the board, um, Bob Atwell, tremendous resource, and uh, he understands biz our business, and we have a very honest and open relationship, and he's a great resource. Our, our corporate attorney's on the board, my father, Sir's father. Uh, we have an industry, uh, uh, somebody that was a president of a bicycle company is an advisor on the board. Whether you have a board or you have people around that you can use as a resource to validate what you're trying to get done, it's important to have people. Or to say, whoa, Chris, you're crazy. Did the board, has the board ever said to you, oh my gosh, don't do that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were looking at buying another company and we, we went through the, the whole analysis and they didn't feel that the timing was right. And so... We and, listened, you re we and you respected that? Absolutely. Not that I didn't uh, feel that there was great value or opportunity, but uh, you have a board for a reason. You better listen to these people. Mm -hmm. He gets out to the, to the dealer. You know, here's the president of the company. He goes out to the dealer and talks to him. I bet he knows 90% of the people he's met anywhere in the industry. He remembers their names. He focuses on, on the people all the time. He, example, this spring brought in six of the top dealers, Chris uses the word, bell cow dealers, to, um, we brought them in, came into Graber, they were here for two days, and they actually ended up going up to Door County, where we have a cottage up there, a family cottage, and they go up there and it's just sit and it's just focus. They can have some good time to blend and build the relationships, which I think he's really strong at, but also they sit down, he asks, with, with his salesman, they, they focus in on what the end user is going to want. What are you missing in your product line that we can accomplish for you? And through those, they list the priorities of what we have, what they want to see, where we should go, and we use those in the product development. And we use those positively in making the product they want and they want to sell. And out of these six people, only two of them at that time were your customers. Yes, and the other four were the Bell Cow accounts that we didn't have. And so now, what's the and end of that? And now, just in the, within the last few months, that's how long it took, was to say, we'll take your product. We value what you're doing. And it's a relationship building. Chris is 
Chris is really outstanding at the relationship building in the industry. What do you think it takes internally to be able to shoulder the risk of business? You, you need to take, uh, I, I think a lot of it, Hattie, is attitude and a never give up attitude. And it's just uh, keeping your head down and driving through the hard times. Because if you look up, you may lose your head. It, and it's a ne abs the biggest thing that, that as a business owner, for you to be successful is never give up. Never, ever give up. When we bought the business, we got this patent infringement. Chris went to the previous owners and said, we got this. It's not settled. We feel like it came before the purchase. And they settled easily. It was all calm. We thought it was gone. Business thrived. We developed and actually added on to a new product to get our name back out into the market. And um, it did very well. And then we got, about 18 months later, we got this another letter. We're infringing. And we thought it was all settled because it was on the existing, the existing patent. And what I've learned in, in that short, well, it ended up being about th four months, um, I learned that this bigger company knew exactly what they were doing. We went to trial in March. Um, it was a simple, tiny part of a patent. We went to a jury trial. Everything that we said what we were told wouldn't happen did happen. In the end, I, we lost 10 times more than we thought and had to cease to produce in the spring. So this big, I really believe the big company wanted us out. They saw us at that time as a challenge to them and they thought, let's snuff these guys out now so we don't have to deal with them in the future. And the bankruptcy issue was, a, was brought up. I mean, Chris and I were both very clear. Um, so you all lost a million dollars in that scenario. Right. And when you lost a million dollars and also had to shut production down, mm -hmm. you said to yourselves, all right, what are our choices? And right. bankruptcy was a legitimate and choice. probably the number one choice for the people around, people around us, saying, this is the way you'll survive. But that's also re the relationship with the bank we had. Chris, once again, it's the value in Chris. I mean, he's a survivor, the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, we both sat down and talked, and it's just bankruptcy just wasn't an option. I mean, just there's something that grates you wrong in it. We looked at that, but that would have, um, we didn't feel that was morally or ethically the way to do it. And, um, and the bank also supported us and said, okay, this is what we can do to get, this is how we can help, this is what we're going to require of you. And so we've been carefully watched. But um, it, was, it was a bad time for us, not only in the money issues, but it was the moral issues. For me especially, that I was just, I was dumbfounded because I believed in people so strongly and what they were saying that I was, I, was, I think, more, more so than Chris, maybe. We've been through the valley of death, and the way we've come through is our commitment to get through it and our determination to get through it. Were you ever scared when you were in the valley? Sure. Did you ever think, whoa, I might not have the wherewithal to pay? It was never an option. We had to find a way to be successful and make this thing work. In Sarah and Chris, I see soft hearts and strong backs. What a combination. It's obviously working. Something really exciting happened recently, right? Uh, Saturn had uh, approached us uh, August of 95, and they were very interested in the Cirrus roof rack system. And we've been working with them over the last two years from testing and uh, validation of the program. And they've chosen us as a supplier for their roof rack over the largest competitor in the world. And it, it was due through uh, because of the product innovation and uh, their willingness to work with a smaller company. I don't think I've seen a rack any easier than this to install now, will a vehicle. I have to adjust it each time I put it on? We're the exclusive supplier of a detachable roof rack system for Saturn today. The nice thing about the rack is that it's totally adjustable so we can position these legs wherever we want. Swaying, if you watch somebody from behind on these real cheap racks, mm -hmm. the bikes and the rack are actually moving back and forth as the car travels. This one won't do that because you've got support in six different places. Sarah focuses on the people part. Okay. Um, I kind of make sure they're okay more on the personal side love to talk, so I'm out there wondering what's going on with them, finding a lot of things out. There's some employees that will come up and spend a lot of time with me, you know, just talking, and, and there's a, usually get a hint of a reason they're around. 
Right. Well, and, and don't you think that is part of the reason this is all working? Right. I do. I do. And that every employee here feels comfortable to come tell you anything they mm -hmm. want. The slogan at Graber Products is, make ourselves obsolete, invent the new products before a competitor can. By working with the University of Wisconsin, Chris has tapped into the minds of an innovation and manufacturing team that helps business owners streamline the production of new ideas. He has given employees the tools and time to innovate, and he himself focuses his own attention on innovation. The day after we were with Chris, he was on a plane to Italy to meet a designer. When Chris and Sarah bought Graber, they bought a solid business with a good reputation, but the sales were flat. The employees were dedicated, but the company needed fresh energy to start growing again. The energy has come from Chris and Sarah, but also from the thrill of bringing new products to the marketplace. Before your sales go flat, start innovating. At smallbusinessschool.org, there is self-help study for people who want to start a business and for those who want to grow the business they have. From the home page, choose Pathways to Self-Study. Next, you'll find eight steps or stages of growth. At each step, you'll find links to more resources. Also, in the video box for online learning, you can always watch a current episode and you can experience an interactive study guide. Just as so much manufacturing has gone offshore, this business could have headed that way, but Sarah and Chris are determined to keep Graber alive and all-American. Part of the, the, the thing that drove me to pursue this business, I saw so much manufacturing going offshore, representing manufacturers, and, and I just felt that there was a decline in America. And, that it was very important for us to reestablish our manufacturing base. You know, you talk about the service industry and the retail industry, and I really feel that we can, we can uh, build product domestically and compete internationally with the right to design and development. And we're doing that. Right now we're not only in the United States, but we're in 20 countries internationally, and we can do that. Two of our largest competitors, Yakima is down in Mexico now, and Thule's out of, uh, out of Europe, and we feel that we can compete with them. It really does take a survivor. Um, that really describes Chris. Um, and support, you know, from, from people around you. Um, I think Chris and I are really lucky because we give on both sides. Sometimes we, I mean, sometimes it takes us a while to figure that out. But we give on both sides. So running it, I think, is the support. You know, I'd say most small business owners really give a lot of their lives to that business to make it successful. And, um, but that's part of the risk. It's really important as a business leader to carry the torch and continually communicate your values to the company and the vision of your company to your employees. You know a person by the trail he leaves and the people they hang with. And uh, it's very important. Most small business owners do some direct marketing because it's cost effective. And while we can't afford a full page ad in the New York Times, marketing advisor John Wargo says that investing in good design pays off. But you know, many small business people, the fact that they are small business people are creative. Let your creative juices flow. For example, here's a company that really did a very unique design. Planet Design, a graphic design firm in Madison who works with Graber, created these print pieces for another client, American Players Theater. They committed to direct mail eight years ago and have never veered from their plan. A three-part mail campaign goes to patrons and prospects. With this as its only marketing effort, they sell out. Target marketing works. According to Planet Design owner Dana Lytle, a print piece is your sales tool and must embody the values of your company. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to connect with the reader to get the response you want. It sends a very, very important message. We have found in our research that material like this is also set aside for later reading. So not only do you make an initial impact, when it looks and appears to be valuable, people set it aside for later reading. 
If you'd like to know more about what you've seen on this broadcast, go to smallbusinessschool.org. Since we first met Chris and Sarah, they've expanded through acquisition and now the factory is busy all year round. The Fortune's commitment to Made in America continues to motivate them and the entire team at Gravers. Remember Chris's advice, beat your competitors to the punch, invent the new products before they do. We'll see you next week. Small Business School is made possible by support from IBM. We're not just for big business anymore. At our website, built just for you, discover how technology can move your business forward. When it's your business, everything matters. IBM and the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs. Small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do this, my life won't be complete.